All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Perspective Project. Um, got a pretty cool guest today. We got another Oregon State Beaver baseball player with us. Um, someone that I've developed a really good relationship with. Um, also one of Micah's boys. So today we have out of Sydney, Australia, we have Travis Pizzano. So Travis, thanks for being here with us today. Thanks, ET. Um, this is going to be a really cool talk today. Travis and I have had a lot of conversations since I took the position in September, and I, we had a lot of conversations before that, even I before I talked to the position, took the position, and um, whether we were talking through social media on Instagram or commenting on posts, and so I was always been drawn to kind of how Travis goes about his business and how he plays the game. Um, this is someone that is going to have a very long career. He's going to play at the next level. Um, he's a projected top five pick, but... I think it's really good for our viewers today to show that a big thing, at least in my part, and why I even created this is I want people to understand that all these guys, like they're more than just baseball players, like they're human beings too. And so if you, we can start to kind of market that side and see that side of that person, um, I think it's really powerful and it kind of relates to everyone involved. But um, we're going to go ahead and start off. So like I said, so from Sydney, Australia, that's a long ways away. Um, we'll kind of get into the dynamics today of, of how baseball is kind of presented in Australia and it is a bigger sport in Australia. Um, but Travis and I have had conversations about that and then transitioning to the United States and how that transition has been for you. Um, and just like growing up and kind of aspirations. And now like I've, I've been able to hear kind of his purpose and his why behind things. And, and it's really cool. And I think people need to hear it. So again, welcome on, but let's start with with growing up have you always wanted to play baseball like has that always been a dream and aspiration for you or yeah as long as i remember i wanted to be a baseball player mm -hmm. i i think like kindergarten first grade that kind of age group when they do the kind of survey of like what's your dream job or what yeah. do you want to be when you grow up i'm almost certain i was putting baseball player or major league baseball player or something like that so yeah, I think from the first time I was around a baseball field, mm -hmm. I was just flat out in love with the game and wanted to be the bat boy for my brothers and mm. um, just hang around there all day and practice. And um, yeah. Now, do you feel like, I mean, even taking your back yourself back to when you were that young and saying like, man, yeah, I want to, I want to play in the big leagues. I want to be a professional baseball player. Was that something that was kind of frowned upon? especially in Australia? Like, what was the, di the dynamic kind of growing up? Yeah, I, it definitely wasn't frowned upon. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really have many people in my, like, closest circles, especially in school, to relate to that. Mm, okay. But um, a lot of my friends were very athletic and competitive, and they kind of understood that I wanted to be good at baseball, and mm -hmm. uh, they didn't really, like, think that was a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It was just different. Makes sense. Um, now I guess, so w at what point did you feel like, oh man, like you, you're starting to develop like physically as a player and then also like your love for the game where you were like, man, there's, there's a real opportunity to, to kind of play at the next level. Like when did that start to kind of kick in Yeah, and like your progression when you were younger? Yeah. I think the time where I was like, okay, like I'm definitely going to pursue this when I get old enough in the U S and. And I really think I've got a chance to like be great in this game. Was probably when I was like ten or eleven. I went to it was the first time I represented Australia, mm -hmm. and that was at the thirteen U Cal Ripken World Series. Okay, which is like re different regions win their region, right, and go right. from the U.S. and then there's like a Japanese team, Korean team, uh, Puerto Rico or Dominican, Australia. Yeah, and you go and play, and the world bracket plays, and then the American back bracket mm -hmm. plays. It's like the Little League World Series, right? Right. And uh, yeah, I played in that with Team Australia as I think an eleven year old, and I had a really good tournament uh, against some some of the best competition I'd ever played against. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that was like, wow, America's fun. Baseball in America is cool because there's better fields, mm -hmm. we get better gear, um, and it was also like exciting to me to compete against people from all around the world and I really wanted to do that into the future and then I've had more opportunities like that and they continue continue to propel me into like loving 
the pursuit of baseball. Yeah. And now, was this, did this happen in the United States? Yeah. Where, where specifically? This tournament? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it happened in uh, Aberdeen, Maryland. So oh, okay. Actually, so you're where on the, the East Coast. Okay. Yeah, right where the Iron Birds play. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is an affiliate with the Orioles. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it's like the Ripken Fields in Aberdeen. That's cool. Like lots of mini junior fields. Yeah. yeah. Now, was that like your first experience coming over to the States? Or had you been over a couple times previously? Like That was my first experience in the States. It was my second time out of Australia. Um, one was for family holiday. Okay. But first time in the U.S. And I only got to really experience Maryland. And I think we went to D.C. for a game. Yeah. To watch the Nationals play. So, yeah, it was my first time. And it was all totally new to me. But it was it was a really good experience. We had a... We stayed in a hotel in our prep for the tournament, and then mm-hmm. once the tournament was beginning, we stayed with the host family. Yeah. Um, and host family experiences, at least to my, like, to this point in my career, like, have always been awesome. That's awesome. Just great people, and, like, I remember eating, catching catching crab, like, fresh out the river, mm-hmm. then putting, I think, Old Spice or, like, some special seasoning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Actually, it's not Old Spice, like Bubba Gump or some, something. Yeah, There's yeah. a couple different things. I'm losing the track of that. But, yeah, some crazy experiences from that Maryland trip. And, um, yeah, it was awesome. Now, I'm, I'm assuming as you got older, right, were you just solely playing for – I don't necessarily know how it works in Australia, but were you playing for a club team? Did you guys travel out of Australia quite a bit? Like, when did you start spending more time, especially as you were in high school or early years of high school – Like, did you come over to the United States quite a bit? Yeah. So the time that the U.S. kind of ramped up for me was probably 15, like coming to the U.S. But I I came over when I was 13 for a tournament. Yep. And it was like some of my biggest mentors running this team to go to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And again, just see what it's like. Like, Yeah, yeah. Kind of give the dream to the Australian kids. Like, this is what it looks like. This is how exciting it is. Come check it out. And then 15 was when things began to get more serious with, like, go play in the U.S. to then develop because there's these tournaments where you're going to learn a lot and you can play against extended spring training teams in Arizona Complex yeah, or go to the Fall Classic in Arizona and try to get recruited. And so I had a couple different trips, mainly to Arizona from, like, 15, 16, 17, um, I came over multiple times for just like short couple weeks during stints. Okay. Uh which were really good. Yeah. And that was probably something too that kind of sparked even your interest more and you're like, okay, one, I really want to do this. I want to make a career out of this. But two, was that the farthest west you'd been? Yep. In the States? Okay. Yep. And then so when did I gotta ask is again, coming from Sydney, Australia, literally all the way across the world and you end up landing at Oregon State, like what was the recruiting process like for you? Yeah, recruiting process was interesting because going into the time that I like knew I was getting recruited playing in the U.S. and actually having coaches watch me, I like had no idea where I'd end up. Like it was no, I could have been at a Division two junior college mm-hmm. in Iowa or I could have been at Oregon State. So you were open to anything at like, this point. Like I was pushing for what I wanted, but yeah. I... It was really like whatever the best opportunity was that was going to come up is what I was going to take. So essentially in 2018, I came over to the U.S. and I was like in hopes of getting recruited really young Mm because I'd seen all the guys on Instagram and stuff committing to big Power 5 schools at like 15, 14 years old. And I was like, I think I'm good enough to do that. Yeah. I played really well. I got coaches telling me, oh, yeah, like – this all these schools contacting us like there's a lot of a lot of demand for you right now like mm-hmm. we're gonna get you a college offer and then just crickets like nothing from this first tournament when I was young and I played really well against all the competition I was like damn like okay I guess I just gotta come back and get better yeah and so that next year I'm like grinding for that next time I come over for two weeks same tournament Mm -hmm. I'm like I gotta be even better and I I really prepped my I did a lot of school stuff like with SATs and Mm -hmm. and getting my grades figured out 
Um, so that that was like a part of the package. Like it's like, hey, look at this guy. He's also got this. Yeah. Um, like the value you could provide. Yeah, value yeah. I could provide for like, let's get this kid recruited. For like, sure. Oh, he's not he's not really bad at school or something mm-hmm. like that. So mm-hmm. I really got on top of that. Um, and then it was just preparing myself to have the tools that would stand out like right away. And um, yeah, I went over in 2019, same tournament I went in the year before. And again, played hard, played well, had a lot of schools really pay the interest then and mm-hmm. some people in my corner helping me kind of seal the deal and yeah. doing a lot of talking for me and yeah Oregon State came out and saw me for a couple games and they were one of the one of the like schools that I was kind of interested in or my dream schools that yeah. that offered me and it was just the perfect perfect scenario I felt really comfortable with the coaching staff uh, thought Corvallis was going to be a good place for me and I I knew that the development and the rich winning history at Oregon State was going to be perfect. So I, that was that trumped every other school that ever contacted me. Yeah. So I, I mean, my takeaways from that, especially when it comes to Oregon State, and we can get into that more. But really, what you're saying, I feel like, is, and for all the viewers out there and the listeners, like when you're in your process and even recruiting since like you've got recruited since I've gotten recruited, like it's changing, it's ever evolving now with NIL and and where things are at, but. I still think there needs to be the basis of like, man, can you can you envision yourself on campus? Can you envision yourself living there in the day to day? And like also what you mentioned about the relationships with the coaching staff, like that's a huge part that I feel like sometimes is overlooked, especially now in a realm where it's like, man, money's getting thrown at kids like left and right on the NL, NIL side. And also, this is something that isn't necessarily fully guaranteed sometimes, too. Like, a lot of people want to tell you what you want to hear. So I think being able to really use your gut, especially when you're on campus, and make it, you know, like, proceed forward in really trying to create good, valuable relationships with the staff. Like, because I feel like you start to get a better notion for, man, these people are actually really invested in me. Right. And this is somewhere where I can truly develop and, like, become a better baseball player and live out my dream. Yep. And then along the way, it's like, man, what a what a cool opportunity, especially we have this year. We'll get into that later in the conversation with our squad. But I feel like moving forward, what with the relationships with the coaching staff, what really like stood out to you that was different maybe from like other schools, like as far as like with Oregon State? Yeah, I think it's hard. The, the comfort came from like I felt – I felt as if like naturally you're around some people Mm -hmm. and you feel like you are just yourself Mm. and there was no thinking. It's just subconscious. You're like, wow, time's flying. Mm -hmm. Time's flying. Conversation's easy. I really like this dude. I like that dude too. And why? It's because I'm literally being my purest self and it feels right. Yeah. And on other recruiting visits, not all of them, like there was a lot of good ones. Of course. But like, I felt like I was still trying to like, play this like part or like be mm. a certain character yeah and from the moment i met like an oregon state staff member and took the drive um down to Corvallis or up to Corvallis, i don't even know but um i was like super comfortable and i remember that drive i always I'll always reference it is like i get picked up by jake rodriguez yep um at pdx yep shout out j-rod yeah shout out <laughs> j-rod and it literally was a two hour trip to Corvallis or hour and a half. And it felt like 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. And I like, I kid you not. That was like the craziest thing to me. I got out of the car. I was like, wow. Like yeah. that was, that was an hour and a half. It felt like 10, 15 minutes That's because dope, man. the conversation was so good. And that went on for that visit the whole time. I just felt like I was like comfortable. And I also felt like the, the desire to win and like, the focus on everyone like everyone's personal growth and getting better mm-hmm. and like just coach player relationship just felt right and I was like that's perfect yeah and it's it's cool to be able to be in a situation and even reflecting for myself like the time that I was there and and we had some great years there and of course like win a national championship but like I all f- also referenced the culture and it's something that when I transitioned out I was I was fortunate enough. I got to play some independent baseball and got to explore a different part of the country. But I realized like 
for me and like with my skill set and what I was trying to do, like what I really missed and why I had such a good time playing college baseball was it was that it was like the relationships that I built. It was like the culture and it's like everyone's on the same page wanting to win. And of course, you don't get that maybe necessarily in professional baseball, especially as you're developing, you're working your way through the minor leagues, and you're trying to get to the show. But I think that's what honestly brought me back and like even being able to develop a relationship with our staff now like and just being welcomed in you know wholeheartedly and it's like I think it goes to note that just like everyone that is on staff like everyone it, it speaks volumes that everyone is a former alumni you know and everyone wants to come back and be here for a reason and I think it kind of feeds into that that culture and the dynamic at Oregon State oh. so um no man just powerful and now okay taking a step forward so you have a pretty good freshman year when you get down on a campus. Um, what was, I know, so this was after your freshman year, and again, had a good year, kind of kind of make a name for yourself, and you guys make a nice little run. Um, that summer, what did that look like for you as far as training? Yeah, I um, decided to, to train that summer and not play some of all. Um, and I went to driveline mm -hmm. in Kent, Washington. I'd known about driveline for a long time. Um, and I'd always, it had always like piqued my interest. Mm -hmm. And I really thought that was like something that I could gain an edge from there and a hitting department that wasn't very well known at that point, but like I knew they had some powerful stuff. And so I was like, I want to go train there and I want to, and I'd do that. So I, I'm sitting, <clears throat> sitting at the airport during the season or maybe when right after the season was ended. It was right near the end of the season. Okay. And I was just like in my spare time kind of thinking about um, what I would be doing in the summer. Because I was like, I wanted, kind of wanted to train, but if I wanted to not play summer, well, I'd have to let someone know soon. So right. once I had that thought, I was like, I actually have to do something about it. I can't just leave it till the end of the season. Yeah. And so I start, <clears throat> I have these documents about driveline and driveline hitting and... I started writing down goals on them on their like report sheets and stuff and started to figure out what it would look like and mm -hmm. what I want to work on. And then I was like, all right. And I hadn't really talked to anyone about it yet. And Gip came over <laughs> and he's like, what are you, what are you looking at? What is this? And he's like, Oh, like, yeah. Well, why, why are you looking at that? I'm like, uh, like, I think I want to go there <laughs> instead of some wall. And like, we have like within three minutes, he was like, yeah, like, I think that's a sick idea. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I know I need to tell Skip now because Skip kind of has a relationship with the Sunball coach mm -hmm. and he's got to let him know that I might not be coming. Um, do you think you'll be cool with that? And he's like, yeah, it should be fine. A week later, I have that conversation. And anyway, I get up to driveline. I just felt like I had a lot of room to improve in terms of, I knew I had bat to ball skills, but I felt like my ball flights weren't as consistent as they could be. Mm -hmm. Um, I felt like I had an engine. I was a powerful athlete, but I wasn't really slugging and I wasn't really hitting the ball that hard. Mm -hmm. so I was like, I need to unlock something there. And yeah, I went there, assessed, and my assessment was pretty bad. I was like, I was probably down eight pounds from the season, felt pretty weak. Mm -hmm. Just lost the super regional, just kind of down. Yeah, of course. And I'm there getting an assessment, and it was just, like, not good. It wasn't hitting the ball hard. Swing was kind of loopy, linear, bad posture. Just, like, flared ball flights everywhere. And uh, I was supposed to be a guy when I came in there. They were like, oh, this is this guy, this freshman All-American. Like, yeah. And they were definitely like, damn, he's really not, <laughs> really not that good. And I was like, okay, whatever, all good. They didn't say that to me, but, like, they definitely were thinking that. And uh, and you were probably kind of, there's part yeah, of you that was thinking this, like, after the assessment, right? You're 100%. like, holy shit, I'm not, like, as I'm, good as maybe I thought yeah, I was. I'm there, and, like, I'm hitting, I'm hitting rounds that are, like, the same quality rounds off, like, the machine and stuff as kids that are maybe not high schoolers, but, like, D2 freshmen or, like, yeah. Juco, like, grinders. Yeah. And I'm like, damn, I'm meant to be a starter on one of the best teams in the country. Like, I got to step my game up. And, uh... Yeah, anyway, there was a lot of a lot of things I needed to clean up. And mm -hmm. it mainly began with my posture. And yeah, we got to work. They showed me why the things mattered that they wanted me to adjust in my swing. Mm -hmm. Um and the power of their training methods and then we got after it and I was there for ten weeks and 
made some huge strides and that proceeded to help me play out into 2023 and have a lot of success. Yeah. And now I want to get back to when you actually made that decision. I'm sure there was part of you because this is still a time period where driveline was starting to pick up kind of like a lot of steam and they're mm -hmm. having more and more professional guys mm -hmm. and college guys train there that are higher level. Mm -hmm. But even at that point in time, like there was probably a lot of people thinking like, oh, dude, why is this guy not playing? Mm -hmm. Like he should go to the Cape or he mm -hmm. should do this and do that. Right. And so mm -hmm. I think it just goes to show that when you are writing down, like one of the most powerful things you just said is like being able to take their sheets and you're writing down your goals. And like, this is exactly what I want to do. Yep. Like you had an idea and you had a vision long before you even stepped foot into that building yep. because you had this feeling of like, dude, there's more in here. Yep. Like I'm all, not only am I only coming off a good season because you could have very really easily gone the other way and be like, dude, I'm trying to take some time off. Like I need to get my body right. I'm feeling down from the season. When you took it the other way of like, dude, there's way more in there. There's untapped potential. I need to clean some things up if I really want to get to where I want to be. Mm -hmm. And I thought you taking initiative and being able to pursue this, even though it's kind of on a different path than what a lot of people thought you should have done. Mm -hmm. So I think just making a quick note of like, when you have a plan of attack and you feel like you're doing the right things with your process, it's like, we talk about that all the time in mental skills, but it's like committing to your process and what you feel like is right in that situation for yourself. Yep. And now it's like, look at where it's gotten you. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And so I think it just goes to show, and even for all the viewers, whether, you know, we have a lot of followers that are hearing Travis, that maybe you're younger in your process, or maybe you're a high school kid, right? Or maybe you're a parent watching this and you have someone that your kid's kind of coming up and has aspirations to play at a high level. It's like, understand there's always going to be people in your ear, like, and especially the better you get, like the more people are going to tell you that you need to do a certain thing when really this needs to be more of an individualized approach and like understand like you got to know what you need and what's best for you and like reaching out and utilizing resources that maybe it's you're kind of on a different path but like i mean look what it's done for someone like travis right and now he's set himself but he's in this position because he took ownership over a situation so i just think that's kind of like a powerful thing to note so now take me through like going through your sophomore year you clearly like you made some great adjustments. You had a better year than you even did your first year. So kind of talk me through that year, like especially coming off a of drive line. How do you feel? Not only did you make adjustments physically with your swing, right, and understand how to move better and why you did the things that you did, but how were you able to take that approach? And do you feel like that helped you from a mental standpoint too, 100%. with the confidence piece? Yeah, I I feel like I I always had deep down confidence and belief in myself, mm -hmm. but freshman year, like I definitely rode some where my confidence would dip a little bit i'd still be confident but my approach would drastically change and my plan at the plate or on defense yeah like my mental state yeah my confidence would dip but it was like the confidence dip would throw off just my where my thoughts were at mm. um as a whole freshman year up and down and so i'd like ride waves where i'd i'd punch the first up out of the game and then I'd be worried about getting to two strikes later in the game. And yeah. it's like, just because I like, I don't want to punch again. Right, it's right. It's like that fear of striking out. And you obviously end up striking out, at least I thought, you, you end up striking out more. Because I ended up swinging at all these one strike pitches. Yep. Because I'm like, I just swing it, the, they throw something in the dirt. And I'm like, I got to hit it in play, foul it off, whiff, punch, like mm -hmm. whatever it was. So I think being worried about striking out just, Threw, threw me off in little bits uh, freshman year because I thought, like, I had such high expectations for myself, and I always do, but once the older guys kind of stepped up and showed what they could do and I was, like, kind of struggling, I was like, damn, like, I just, like, lost kind of some confidence, I'd Of say, course, yeah. And rode it up and down. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, the biggest change, like, once I learned what, where I was weak freshman year, like, my, my biggest weaknesses, and I worked on them, I felt like I'd made the adjustments I needed swing-wise. And then I talked to all the people closest to me about what the approach adjustments were going to be. And where was I Where was I making myself struggle? Where was I getting myself out offensively freshman year? And it was like I was chasing heavily in hitters counts. Mm -hmm. So, like, I'd get 2031, and I would swing at things that I would never swing at. Like, yeah out of the zone because I'm thinking to myself before that pitch, when I'm struggling, I'm like, now's my chance to hit the double, hit the home run. Like I have to take advantage of this fastball right here. Like I have to. 
and then I'd miss or swing at something terrible mm -hmm. because I'm trying to do too much versus like just be on time or something. Of course. And then the other part of it was like I'd get to one strike and I'd just swing, also swing like at a very high clip um, and maybe be way too contact oriented mm -hmm. with one strike versus like getting a pitch to drive and actually trying to do some damage it. yeah because i was trying to not get to two strikes and uh that, again that was only for periods of time freshman year but the confidence and and everything i like talked to the people i needed to figured out a more clean consistent approach in the box and cleaning up the it was, i don't know if it was a hole but cleaning up my ability to hit pitches up in the zone mm -hmm. um especially fastballs with ride from the swing adjustments allowed me to have an approach where I was more centered to the middle and middle up part of the zone. And that allowed me to swing at less bad pitches. Yeah. And then also just, I had a clear, consistent, confident like plan most mm -hmm. of the time when I went to the plate and that was what propelled me as much as the swing stuff propelled me. It's like, I was this much better freshman and sophomore year as a, talented player but my mental game and my consistency my ability mm -hmm. to consistently go out and perform because of where i was at here and my routines and everything like i grew freshman and sophomore year and i got that much better at that and so my numbers were exponentially better as a right. player but really it was just like a combination of two things it wasn't just the physical but everything just kind of clicked together yeah and it seems like with your with your sophomore year like what you were just telling me is like the okay the mental game drastically got better and so you became more consistent in what you were trying to do and of course the skill Scott skill set got better but you saying and again really important for our viewers like the the mental aspect and like having a clear and like identifying an approach that works for you and really understanding like what you were trying to do pitch to pitch like that fed into your confidence yep. and then when you can worry like just worrying about the things that are actually in your control that takes care of the results yep. and that's one of the hardest things to do i would even say not only for like everyone involved whether you're a high level college player whether you're playing professional baseball like everyone like we always have those thoughts of like doubt or we have those anxieties and things like try to creep in but when we have a clear more consistent plan of like how we're actually trying to attack and i feel like that's really important because when you do have a plan of attack it's like man, I'm aggressive in my approach now. Like you're up there trying to do damage. Like you're saying all these key words versus it seemed like your freshman year when you had those dips, you were kind of caught in the middle ground of like, it was passive of like, I'm not trying to get out. I don't want to make a mistake. Yep. And then that's what kind of screws you as far as like the up and downs of the roller yep. coaster that happen. Yep. So now taking it into going into your junior year, right? Like, of course, like projected top five pick, like our team as a whole, like we're preseason ranked as a top 10 team. Like how do you manage your personal expectations, the team expectations, like like how, cause a lot of times like that can bog us down as human beings. And I don't care who you are and how strong your mental game is, but like, what are the things that like you go back to? Like, how do you put things in perspective, I guess? Yeah, I've been, this navigating that's all new to me now, mm -hmm. I'd say like, yeah, like I, I was, I played as a freshman, I did well, like I had some kind of buzz and expectation. Yeah. And the team has always had expectation. But again, from the summer, it's just like, that's rose to a different level now with that stuff. Of course. And I think the biggest things that have been important now navigating it, and I know are gonna be the keys um, as soon as the season starts and beyond is like, keeping my inner circle close and having constant conversations with them mm. just like like just constantly being in contact with them mm -hmm. whether it's a touch base quick phone call or like a deep vulnerable conversation like just constantly being in touch with those people and those are like my mentors like i have a i keep a list of my like those people that like just as a reminder like those are the people i i need to keep in Absolutely. my life it's like there's a couple big mentors skip being one of them absolutely like, i need to keep on with him because he's going to keep me grounded keep me in the right place mental state for sure um like my family and friends kind mm -hmm. of the same thing it's like i i keeping those people close um and then the other part is like if i control my process and like my controllables on a daily basis and just focus on like today present like what do i need to control what do i need to do get yeah. it done do my work bring my best energy 
Um, and then that allows me to like pour good energy into everyone else around me. Absolutely. And then there's no pressure. There's no nothing. Cause I'm not in my head. I'm like, I'm doing what I need to do, mm. giving good energy to other people. And that like being that process and like things I can control focus is going to allow me to then not get caught in the external noise. Yeah. That, that was really well said. Um, I think it's it's funny because the the better that you get at something, I think this is across the board, like not just sport or the higher level that you get and the more so more attention that comes with that. But really like attention, it's just like there's all these distractions that start to arise and like people want to mess with you more and like everyone wants to be your best friend and this and that. But a lot of people just like, again, they want to be cool with you because it's like, man, you're really good at what you do and great at your sport. And while that validation piece is huge, right? But there's also a piece of that that's like, it's feeding our ego. And I think what you were just talking about right there is like understanding that you can't do this or go about this process completely by yourself. Like it almost be ignorant to be able to think that you could do it all on your own. Because I almost think the better that you get at something, the more you realize, wow, okay, there's a lot I don't know and maybe situations I don't know how to navigate. And so even having like your inner circle that you're talking about, like people that can keep you grounded, that can keep you humble, that can really help steer you on the right path. Like Skip says it all the time, and this has really stuck with me and, and what I say to our guys, like as far as mental skills go, but it's like for every mile of road, there's two miles of ditch. Yeah. And I think that's something that Travis is really talking about as far as being able to keep people in his life that he knows that he can trust and steer him on the right direction. Yep. So, and then you don't worry about all the things that are outside of your control. Yep. Yep. And I, I love that because I was thinking about kind of saying this earlier in a different question. It's like, part of what's helped me grow to this point and like continue to get better is I've always had a plan. Mm -hmm. And I think like having a plan and having a vision and being passionate about it is so important. Like without that, you just, you, you're going in the ditch and then you, someone's going to get you out of the ditch, yeah. whatever. So it's like, first off, you got to have the plan so that you have the road ahead and it's not just ditch, ditch four different roads oh, for sure. But like the plan is the road. And then like, learning how to control the controllables to stay on the road and have the people that are going to be the barricades yes and keep you from the ditch yes like that's how you get there but you got to have the plan first and i think i'm constantly like i'm thinking about the future when i get the chance to s sit with my thoughts mm -hmm. and like what's my plan where do i want to go what kind of steps am i going to take but then it's like okay now i'm present like how do i control those things on a now basis um so yeah, super important. Absolutely. And now I think one last thing that, that I want, not only that I want to hear again, that I thought was great that you talked about, and we actually talked about this probably like two weeks ago, but we sat everyone down. We had all the position players cause we were kind of broken off into individual times. And we do like, we do heavy meditation practice. We do a lot of mental imagery, of course. And we've been doing this since September, but I like to pull the guys off and we'll have really like they're kind of just quicker talks that we talk for like 15 minutes and I pose maybe a question or an idea. And one of those things was we were talking about like your why and like purpose. And I think kind of that goes into what Travis was just talking about and what we were just kind of talking about the last 10 minutes is like how important it is to be able to like one, you don't have to do this thing all by yourself when you're going through like a hard process and like understanding when the road's gonna get kind of bumpy sometimes and you're gonna get yourself, you're gonna encounter storms but it's more just like being better equipped to handle those things. But I think when you have a sense and like you have a bigger purpose or you have a bigger why, like bigger than yourself, like it makes it a lot easier to understand, like then you start to understand impact and like what an opportunity that you have in the situation that you're in, how talented you are, of course, like everyone knows that, but like how you can impact other people along the way. And so I just kind of wanted to finish up. I wanted everyone to hear like, Man, like with baseball, like wh what is your purpose? What is your why? Yeah. It's funny. So I like, obviously we had that conversation, but I think I mentioned to you after like our why, or at least my why has constantly kind of evolved. Yeah. But it's just, it's just grown into like, as I mature, I understand there's more, there's things that are more valuable than certain like mm -hmm. things. And so like at 15, if you ask me a why, it's like, because I want to be great at baseball. Like yeah. I want to play in the major leagues. Like how cool is that? And then like 16, it was probably like, because I want to prove this guy wrong Yep. because he thinks I'm not that good and I'm going to be a big leaguer. 
and I want to prove him wrong and I want to prove everyone wrong. That was probably me at 16. 18, it was like um, probably a similar thing. But then as it's just like evolved, it went from kind of loving the game, wanting to be great, um, and wanting to prove to people that I'm like going to be at the pinnacle and no one, like you didn't believe in me, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And like that stuff still fuels me, but that was sort of like, I didn't really have a deeper why than like, I was just passionate, loved the game and I would use those things as fuel. Right. And then it, like, as I've seen, like the way my like journey played out as a kid and like how much it just feels like you don't have people backing you. Mm -hmm. There's just small groups of people backing you because like, oh, like, they're too good at fielding in the in Latin America. They're too strong in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, you have to go to junior college because coming out of Australia, you're not ready for the competition of Division One baseball. And it was just like everyone, for the most part, it was like a lot of doubt. Yeah. And I always used that as negative and whatever. But now it's like I've gotten to a point where I'm moving forward. I'm really – I've matured as a person. And I, like, look at that and I'm like, oh, like – Yes, it's negative, but like now I have the opportunity to totally change an outlook of mm. I can change the path for the next me, the next kid that wants to be a baseball player or the next kid that wants to do something great, but he plays baseball as a kid and he's hearing from me talking or whatever it is. There's like, I've, I've come to understand the power I have in the position I put myself in now. And mm -hmm. with social media, there's a lot of young baseball players that get to see what I'm doing, get to see cool highlights, get to see us playing regionals and um, just cool edits and stuff that Oregon State does of me and whatever. Like, they, that stuff's super sick. Like, yeah. I would have loved to see that when I was 15. And now I'm in it. And it's like the traction I have in that front and then also, um, like, leading up to becoming a pro and, and mm -hmm. the draft and stuff, like, there's so many people pulling my way now. And right. I felt like I didn't have people pulling my way when I was a kid. And now everyone's pulling for me. And it's like, I want those kids to feel like there's someone pulling for them and there's opportunity and they can see ahead. Yeah. Um, and I can change the narrative for that if I continue to like pave a path and then also give back. And yeah, there's, there's opportunities that I'm going to get that a lot of American kids never really get. And that's like playing for my country. Like yeah. you to play in the World Baseball Classic for the Team USA, like you're gonna have to beat out Mike Trout, Bobby Wood Jr., Bryce right. Harper. It's no joke. Like, JT Real Muto, like it's crazy. Yeah. Um but for me, it's like I could be in that team within the next one, two, three years. Mm -hmm. And then I can again like help a team win an, a medal um at a tournament like that, or then go to the Olympics. Yeah. In 2028, 2032. Um, and these tournaments have can have such a big impact on a country, Absolutely. especially like Australia, yep. which isn't as big as the US in terms of like sports population. And mm -hmm. there's just so much power in what I'm doing more than just being a baseball player. It's like I can I can help if I keep getting better. Yeah. Like there's so much behind well, it. Well, and I think what you're saying is like your outlook has changed from maybe just like yourself when you were younger, right? The maturity piece to now it's like formulated and like, man, taking ownership and like, look at the platform I have. Mm -hmm. And like now there's a kid in Australia or there's a group of kids or there's actually full organizations yeah. where maybe there's someone in their ear of like, hey, I don't think you can do this. Like baseball's not as big here. Like the yeah. guys in the States or guys in other countries are crazy. But then they're like, wait a minute, Travis Bazana did That's this. That's it. So. And that's what, no, but that's seriously, like, think it. about, like, that gives me chills. Cause yeah. it's just like, dude, if Trav did it, like, I can do that shit. Yeah. And now that, that small sliver of belief, like, yeah. you have no idea, like, how much that can carry. Cause now he talks to his boy and they're like, dude, we got this. Like, yep. Trav did it, we can do it. Yep. And now you get a whole group and that grows and it grows cause yeah. they cultivate that good energy. Yep. So, that's... and I think hearing you say that, man, and hearing for our viewers too, like, how powerful that really is. Like, to me, that's, that's true impact. Because at, at every point, like, no matter how good you are at the game of baseball, like, when you can understand that you're – it really is. It's a game at the end yep. of the day. But, like, it can provide such a cool opportunity. And I think really what you get down to it is, like, you can provide belief to mm -hmm. a lot of kids that were in your situation that maybe they didn't have 
you know, what, what you had when you were a younger age. Yep. So now that you've been able to be a frontier in this and like come to America and play at a big time school and ball out, right? And be a face in college baseball mm -hmm. and how you carry yourself and that you're a good dude and you want to win, you want to do things the right way. Like it speaks volumes on you, man, but like the ability to be able to represent your country too yeah. and want to help the younger generations coming forth. Yep. Cause like you're trying, you're honestly, you're leaving the game in a better place yep. than when you found it, especially when you were younger. Yeah. No, I, I think it's just like awesome to like, kind of think about and talk about it like in this situation mm -hmm. but like i remember <clears throat> so <laughs> i was at these baseball camps when i was like 10 12 kind of dreaming whatever and then like once i was 16 17 i was coaching the same camps that i um played at and i yeah. got chances to speak in front of some of these kids yeah like 10 12 year olds and i i remember talking about like I've gotten this far, like I'm committed to Oregon State now because I, I believed and I like didn't listen to what everyone said and the ceilings people put on you, like Absolutely. you have your own path and you create it and you put in the work and there's so many resources out there, you just use them and like push towards it. And I like had these conversations with these kids um, and they loved it back then and I, ha I had no platform then really, mm -hmm. a very small platform. and. Now it's like I those kids still contact me and they're like 16. They're like looking for colleges. They're committing somewhere. They're got pro interest and it's so sick how it's already developing. And it's like I know that there's been a total like there's already a shift happening. Yeah. And it's obviously not not all. I'm not claiming that shift is like my right. Right. Shift. Of course. Because there's people in baseball Australia that are really doing the right things right now to pull that pull us into this like new wave. But like. I know I've had a small impact on some people and that's only growing and they're talking about it and they're like, Oh, there's these opportunities and Trav said, you can keep getting better and I'm going to make it one day. And like, they're going to then be the coach. Cause I was, I was the coach at their camp. Yes. Now they're 17. They're going to pursue that yes. same message to the next 10 year old. And it's just like a crazy domino effect because it's such a small community. The further I can take this, the more messages I can give, to the next guy who then can give it and then take his career further. And then it's just like, it's the, the limit is endless in baseball in Australia. Truly. I think it's like you got countries with populations, a 20th, the size of Australia. Oh yeah. And a, a land mass of a hundredth, the size of Australia that create five, 50 times as many big leaguers, yeah. 500 times as many big leagues. It's like, okay. So why couldn't we get a, be good at baseball? Why couldn't we become a powerhouse? Like we're good at other sports. We're great at basketball now. And yep. that narrative changed. Yep. And so it's like, why can't I be the guy that changes the narrative for baseball? Mm -hmm. um, and then it becomes something cool back home. Yeah. Yeah. I love it, man. Like I shoot, you couldn't have said it better. And mm -hmm. I think that's like the perfect thing to end on. Um, I think moving forward and hopefully this kind of is, is a wake up call. To, to everyone watching this and everyone that kind of comes across this, but it's like, not only like have an understanding, like why, why do you do what you do? Like, and when you can start to align yourself and this doesn't even have to be baseball, mm. but when you start to figure out something that you really love to do and there's a passion and like, you know, there's a fire in you that kind of wakes you up every day because you're excited about what you get to go and do. And I know that's for Travis mm. and understanding, you start to understand the impact that you can have on not only just one, two group fulls of people, organizations, but like literally a country, you know what I'm saying? And that's you and everyone else in, in the country of Australia, but like being able to take ownership over that. And it's like, that's powerful. And I know you're just getting excited right there talking about it because mm. it really means something to mm -hmm. you. So I think being able to do it for like a reason bigger than yourself, like I, I think I would highly suggest like understand your why with why you do things. And I think hopefully being able to hear that like provides some pretty good perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, Trav, dude, like keep going about the, the way that you're doing things. Like I think you've had a huge impact on not only like myself, but just I know everyone, I can speak for everyone on staff, everyone like our team at Oregon State like you're a leader, you're a force to be reckoned with, but you're also a really good person. You're a good human being. And like, that's what I, that's what I truly care about. And so I completely value our relationship and what we've been able to build. And then this conversation alone, people yeah. need to hear it and they yeah. want, and I wanted them to hear your story. So yeah. like I said, man, without further ado, I appreciate you having on and I'm excited for this year. Yeah. It's awesome. Thanks. ET. It's awesome.